All right, good morning, everybody. Hope everyone's doing well this morning. We're uh, coming down to the end of our class in uh, archaeological discoveries that validate the Bible. And uh, today we're actually looking outside of the Bible to other religions that were built on biblical foundations. And this is going to be, I think, kind of interesting because uh, what it'll do is it'll show just how um, evidence supports the Bible. And when other people have tried to use similar evidence to support their own ideas, it doesn't work out. Um, sometimes it, it, it actually is a huge problem. And, uh, and that's both of, the, both of the things we're talking about this morning. That is very much the case. So um, start, starting off with Mormonism, um, you, uh, you've got Joseph Smith. And what's interesting, Joseph Smith actually died very young. Uh, I mean, he was, you know, what is that, almost 10 years younger than me when he died. So 39, you know, and um, uh, he made a huge, huge impact uh, on this world because everywhere you go, I mean, there's hardly a country that you, uh, you know, mostly industrialized country that you can go to where there's not a Mormon temple somewhere. Um, now, what's fascinating, fascinating about that is that there isn't, a, as far as I know, there isn't a Mormon temple on earth that actually has a picture of Jesus or the cross. Um, the, the, the thing that you always see is you'll see a little spire and you'll see the, the, the golden figure with the trumpet, Angel Gabriel or Archangel Gabriel. You will always see that. You won't see a picture of Jesus in that kind of position anywhere. And that's absolutely fascinating to me. Um, because if you look at the Book of Mormon, it is what? Man-made. Man -made. You, you remember what the name of it is? Book of Mormon. Another testament or gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, so it's, it's not like Mormons say Jesus isn't important, right? He is very important. But when you look at the symbolism, you don't see a lot of Jesus. Uh, now, that's not, that in itself isn't automatically, you know, a, a litmus test of whether you're biblical or not. I mean, uh, I see nothing in here, right? Oh, uh, you know, cr crosses in here, maybe hidden behind the flowers there. There's one, I think. Um, but you don't see any visible stuff like that here. But we also don't uh, elevate other, other things like the Archangel Gabriel and, uh, and, and prophets like this um, in, 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 in who we are. Uh, because those things are not, right, those things are not biblical to do that. Well, in looking at Joseph Smith, apparently his mother was asked one time about her son and one of the things that she, that she um, identified about him was that he was a fantastic storyteller. And for a lot of people were like, okay, that makes sense now, right? Because <laughs> you've got the Book of Mormon. It's about the size, I think, of the New Testament, uh, maybe a little bit bigger. Um, but, uh, but you see these, these great stories that he tells uh, in there of things that supposedly happened in, you know, biblical times. And um, apparently he knew enough of the Bible to where it sort of sounded believable. Like, um, there's one thing we'll look at in a minute where he, he, he sort of creates these names and, uh, and, and Mormon scholars have really worked over to overdrive in the last, you know, 50, 60 years to try to uh, find somewhere where those names are found. And, they, and there's a couple of them that are similar similar to the Bible, similar to other places, but ultimately creations, right, inventions on, on his part. Now, uh, Mormonism really begins in the 1820s and 1830s, and there was, there was a time in the early 1800s where you have this kind of um, restorationism is sort of what it was called, and you had a lot of groups that became very prominent in this time uh, in fact, Churches of Christ being one of them. Uh, in, this, in this time, where, where things starting to get very prominent. Um, so you've got, you know, Seventh-day Adventists, uh, Jehovah's Witnesses come around, uh, you've got Mormonism. 
all of them claiming to go back to the Bible. And, and this is what Joseph Smith said. He said, you know, he, he, was, he was shown a vision of these two personages, is what he called them. G God the Father and then Jesus Christ is who they were supposed to be. <clears throat> and um, he said they told him that all of these churches were corrupt and they needed to be need to have a, a, a pure religion. And so he goes and he creates Mormonism. Um, now, if you look back at the history of, uh, unfortunately, uh, of the Roman Catholic Church, you can see where a lot, there were a lot of abuses. I mean, still, you know, ongoing, a lot of, uh, unfortunately, uh, abuses uh, there on, on the part of individuals. Um, when you look at uh, institutionalized religion in general, you can see abuse of power almost anywhere you look, in anywhere you look. I want to say even the, you know, the Southern Baptist uh, Convention. Uh, just recently, uh, there was a big scandal about um, um, sexual impropriety among some of their ministers. And there was um, some effort made by some parties to conceal some of these things. You know, so people talk about you know, Roman Catholic priests and altar boys, but there's hardly a, an, an institutionalized religious group on planet Earth where you can't go and find something like that, right? That's, that's, that's human frailty, human sinfulness, and it comes out, right? It, it's, it's sort of a universal thing. Well, um, you look at all of these churches, oh, and they're all corrupt, and they all need to be purged, and so Joseph Smith creates Mormonism. And so he put his storytelling to good work, and he creates these stories of uh, Jewish believers who came over, crossed over the Atlantic, and landed in the Americas, and they built all these massive cities, and all of them had, you know, huge cities, huge temples, just like Solomon's Temple in Jerusalem, and, uh, and all that kind of stuff. But what you find is what the, 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 the stories he created didn't really match the historical situation. Um, if you are a, uh, if you like the history of food, um, and that's like kind of something at our house, <laughs> uh, but if you like the history of food, it's interesting at just how much you, or how often you see where certain foods have migrated to other parts of the world. Um, so, you know, um, wheat, um, or tomatoes, or corn, you know, uh, there's all kinds of foods that existed in some places around the world, but not in others, but in the last two, three, four hundred years, with all the explorations, and all, the, and, and worldwide travel, you've had these, these foods just sort of go around, and you find them in all different kinds of, of locales now. Same thing with animals, right? Uh, you go to, we were talking about koala bears uh, just this past week, well, you don't really find koala bears anyone, anywhere on earth except for in zoos, if they're outside of Australia, really, right? And same thing with spiny anteaters and all those other uh, creatures that Australians have that are uh, very different from what we have, and some, many of them dangerous, right? <laughs> right? Because Australia is the land of dangerous animals for some reason. Um, but, uh, but you have these very, uh, duckbill platypus, right? You have these, these very curious looking animals that are very specific to one part of the world. Um, and and they're, they're different areas, different places where you find that. Well, uh, Joseph Smith didn't understand that. That's a big problem because, oh, he didn't understand that. He also didn't understand technology. And so when you look at what appears in the Book of Mormon, which is called the most correct book on earth, that's what Joseph Smith said. These are all things that appear in the Book of Mormon that did not exist in the Americas in biblical times. So horses, elephants, cattle, goats, pigs, barley, wheat, ironworking, steel, silk, and wheeled vehicles. Um, none of that existed in the Americas um, prior to European exploration. That's a big problem for Mormon apologists. And so what you'll find is, well, there's elephants, but you see... Maybe what was meant by elephants was really this pig that has a long snout that lives in the Americas. I think it's called a tapir. And um, it's kind of like, I think if you saw an elephant and you saw a pig, you'd kind of know the difference, right? You know, I, I don't know any language where those two word, the same word applies to both of those, those animals, right? <laughs> They're just very different. 
You know, horses, horses were extinct in the Americas until uh, European explorers, re Spanish, reintroduced them to the Americas. Um, uh, barley, wheat, ironworking, right? That didn't exist in the Americas. Uh, silk, wheeled vehicles. Now, there were children's toys that were on wheels, but you didn't have, um, you, you didn't have vehicles with that kind of thing. So these are all problems for the Book of Mormon because all of these things are in there. And, of course, what it, what it, just, what it means is uh, Smith just didn't understand. He didn't understand that these things hadn't come over yet. That's kind of a problem if you're a prophet and you write what is called the most correct book on earth <laughs> to have these mistakes in there. So a little bit of an issue. Um, <clears throat> now, um, one of the things that the Mormon church used to claim was that the Smithsonian actually used the book, the Book of Mormon was so accurate, the Smithsonian actually used it to make discoveries in the Americas. And so one of the claims that they had was, it's, uh, this, is, this was a, a statement by the church, uh, during the past 15 years, the Institute has made remarkable study of its investigations of the Mexican Indians, and it is true that the Book of Mormon has, long, has been the guide to almost all of the major discoveries. Uh, the Book of Mormon is now quoted by members of the Institute as an authority and is recognized by all advanced students in the field. In the late 90s, I want to say as late as the late 90s, you could still write the Smithsonian Institution and get their rebuttal letter to this. My father-in-law actually did that. Um, he, he actually wrote them and they sent the letter, uh, the official letter by the Smithsonian uh, denouncing this, saying uh, the Book of Mormon has not led to any discoveries. Uh, our staff cannot verify, you know, this is a religious book, not a scientific book. We can't verify the accuracy of any of its contents. But this is exactly the opposite. This is basically the Book of Mormon is a guidebook to discoveries. And the Smithsonian Institution says it's actually the opposite. <laughs> we haven't used it for anything, right? Well, again, that's part of the problem when you look at this, uh, at, at this book. <clears throat> now, one of the interesting things uh, about the Book of Mormon, and this is a very long, long story that we don't really have uh, time to get into, but one of the things that Joseph Smith said was that the Book of Mormon was written in Reformed hieroglyphics. Um, there is no such thing as Reformed hieroglyphics. Uh, you can ask an Egyptologist anywhere on planet Earth about Reformed hieroglyphics, and they will say they have no idea what you're talking about. But Joseph Smith actually made an alphabet uh, of these characters, and that's it. You see characters, uh, it's misspelled, so that's a, that's a problem. But uh, here's, all the, here's all the characters that supposedly appear in the Book of Mormon. And there's actually, there was an artist who actually made a replica using these characters of the Book of Mormon officially. This was several years ago uh, that this person was commissioned to do this. Now, keep this in mind. So here, here's Joseph Smith's, there's real Egyptian. Okay, let me put them side by side there. Uh, it doesn't take a genius or anybody who can even read to see that these are very, very different, right? Um, and, uh, and so this, is, this was an additional problem for Joseph Smith. Now, there is a, a, a script. Now, a language is, is, is the language, right? The script are the characters that a language is written in, all right? So hieroglyphs is a script, Okay, it's the Egyptian language written in a particular way with these symbols. There is a different script called heretic that is like a cursive form of hieroglyphs. It's kind of like, you know, we could print something or we could write it in cursive. Um, Egyptians did the same thing. Hieroglyphs were like the print form, and they had a cursive form called hieratic that was actually sort of looked a lot like that. But even it still doesn't look like what Joseph Smith said. So... You know, all kinds of issues there. <clears throat> now, um, one, of the, uh, one of the questions we sometimes ask is, are Mormons Christians? Are Mormons Christians? Now, this was a big deal when, you know, Mitt Romney ran for president, and, um, and you still have a lot of this, um, uh, a lot of this today. 
Uh, well, Mormons, are, they're just a different type of Christian. But the problem is that it has a totally different leadership structure, very different from the New Testament, or anything else that's biblical, anything in the Old or New Testaments. Additional scriptures have been proven false. Oops. For some reason, my thing is... Uh, okay, so additional scriptures have been proven false. And then Smith and the prophets who followed him introduced new doctrines that are very odd. And so um, that we'll talk about that in just, just a second here. Now, this is a picture that you can get from the uh, LDS.org, I think, uh, website. This was an Egyptian papyrus, and for some reason it's frozen. Um, this was an Egyptian papyrus that was found... And Joseph Smith said that this was written by Abraham. Abraham wrote this. Uh, in fact, this, um, uh, this picture is supposed to be a picture of Abraham almost getting sacrificed by an Egyptian priest. And the, um, there's all kinds of problems with this because I think Manuel's trying to get me un unstuck here. There we go. Appreciate it, man. There's the original, okay? There, there's the original. And I want to compare these two side by side. We got it. Thank you, my man. Um, there's the two side by side, okay? So you've got several things going on here that are um, sort of reconstructions by, by Joseph Smith. And so you've got uh, the head... Uh, is, is right there is missing. You've got the hand um, is, is missing. And then you got like part of the face and then you got the head of this thing right here. <clears throat> and so the problem for all of this is when Smith, when Smith reconstructed it, he basically um, showed that he had no idea what he's talking, uh, had, had no idea what this was. Because this should be the head of the Egyptian god Anubis. This should not be there. This should be a human head. And if it were Abraham, he should have a beard. So it's a little bit of a problem, right? Because Egyptians shaved. Like, like if you've ever seen like a statue or a bust of a pharaoh, like you might have the, uh, the, 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 the long braided beard that's a false beard, okay? That was worn, that was put on, and you can see the straps uh, on the face of the statue. You can actually see it on the Sphinx, too. The Sphinx originally had a beard. I mean, like Anna knows, but <laughs> that, that went the way of the dodo at some point. Um, but, uh, but Abraham should have had a beard. That bird-looking thing, that is the, actually the Egyptian um, picture of the soul. It should have a human head. And, you know, there have been archaeologists who have just made, made discoveries in tombs of little statues of these things. It's a really weird-looking little creature. It's a, it's, a, it's a bird. Think of an owl, you know, but instead of a bird head, it's got a human head on it. That's what that should look like. And he messed it up, and he said it was the Holy Spirit. And so you've got this, this fictitious creation that was made that showed that he really didn't know what he was talking about. Right? Didn't know anything about this stuff. He was just inventing stories, um, just as he had done for, for his entire life. Uh, when I mentioned the thing about the, um, the Mormon church introducing new doctrines, what you find is a variety of things that are pretty odd. Uh, one is the idea that God was originally a human being, and so he got to, uh, got to be God, and then did all our stuff, like down here, and created people and all that, uh, except that now we get to follow the same path. And so there will be a day when faithful Mormons believe that they will turn into gods, and they'll get their own planet to rule, just like God rules the earth. Uh, you've got baptism for the dead. Um, man, okay, there we go. Baptism for the dead, which absolutely goes against 1 Corinthians 15, 29, right? And so uh, Paul seems to say, you don't get baptized for the dead. You know, no, nobody does this. this. This isn't actually a real thing. But for Mormons, you, you can be baptized for one of your ancestors. Right? You, you can be baptized for a family member who's died. And so Mormons very often keep very, very good genealogical records just for that. Uh, you know, Moveover, Ancestry.com, 
You know, <laughs> they've got nothing on the Mormon church. Uh, and so uh, sometimes people will be baptized for others who have, who have gone on uh, to help to, to, to save them. Uh, you've got the spiritual brotherhood of Jesus and Satan. Uh, this is a little bit, of a, a little bit of an issue, biblically speaking, right? Um, because uh, according to John, Jesus is the one and only son of God. And uh, I was listening to a, um, to a talk show host. This has been maybe 10, 15 years ago. And this uh, caller came in and wanted to embarrass the host. And he was very good. Uh, apparently he got past the screener. Um, he, he was talking to the, to the host and, and just, you know, hey, tell me a little bit more about this. You, you, you've got this event coming up and, and, and you know, what, what's going to go down? You know, how, how are you going to do this? And, and so it was really like an interested caller. He was very, very, very good. Um, and then all of a sudden he goes, well, well how are you going to be honest and do this? And, 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 and yet you believe that Jesus and Satan are brothers. And all of a sudden the host was like, uh, what? And, he, and, he, and then he goes into some of this other stuff. And, uh, and, and, of course, he was cut off almost immediately. But, uh, but, but the host was a, was a faithful Mormon. And, uh, and so this, this caller kept called in and, and kind of embarrassed him on this issue because he thought it would hurt him or hurt his constituency or hurt his influence or something like that. Uh, God has a physical body. That, you know, goes against John 4, 24. God is a spirit. I mean, that's what the text says. God is spirit. And this says God has a physical body. And then you've got the idea of polytheism, right? One of the things that you find in Scripture over and over and over and over and over is there is no God but one, right? There is only one God. Well, that's not the case if you die and you become a God after you die, right? That's polytheism. That's multiple gods. And so, again, you know, you, you look at these, these various doctrines, and these are things where uh, they absolutely, absolutely disagree with Scripture from start to finish, now, the second, the second thing we, we were going to talk about this morning is, more, is uh, Islam. And Islam, Mormonism, um, they're both what you would call historic faiths. And what I mean by that is they are religions that say, well, they are grounded in history, right? And that's an important part of it. You know, Joseph Smith, well, Abraham was a real guy. Um, this whole thing where he almost got sacrificed in Egypt, that was a real thing. You know, our sacred scriptures show that. Or, you know, these, these, all these things where these, um, uh, you know, Jewish settlers uh, uh, crossed the Atlantic and came to the Americas. That was a real thing. I mean, none of that's, none of that's been shown to be proven, uh, been, been proven true. But, you know, it's, in the, it's, it's part of the claims. Islam. Part of the claims are Islam is the one true faith. Uh, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his prophet. And you, um, uh, you look at, uh, the, at the Quran and the biblical characters that we know and love, right? Uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, um, even, the, even guys like Jonah who needed some tutorials, you know, uh, got all, all Islamic prophets, all of them, all of them Islamic prophets. Uh, now, the thing about Islam is, most people really weren't interested in it until this. This is what made Americans everywhere interested in Islam. Uh, I remember hearing uh, this is a, a famous, a famous um, uh, Islamic scholar in America. He's, he's American, but he said he was studying Islam in the '70s, and everyone asked, "Well, why are you doing that? <laughs> why, why are you studying that? There's no point. Right? There's nothing in it." It's kind of like when I was a history major in college and everybody told me, you know, I needed to go get a, a degree in engineering or something because I couldn't do anything with my history degree. Um, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, everybody asked me, well, why are you studying this? You know, nobody studies this. It's not a, it's not a thing. After 9-11, it became a thing, right? Everybody wanted to know. Sales of Bibles went through the roof. Uh, I was working at a Christian bookstore at the time. People came in. We, 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 we were selling Bibles hand over fist. Uh, on, after September 11th. Sales of the Quran also went up because people wanted to know what the Quran was because it's the sacred text for Muslims, right? Well, this was, this was the event that did that, uh, that, uh, that, that, that did that. Now, the, the problem is, you know, we've had several centuries of, hi of history and archaeology and scholarship to give us a good idea of what the ancient world was like. Okay, I, you know, just a minute ago we talked about the Americas. Sa same thing in the Americas. 
Uh, now, if, if you're dealing with archaeology, um, you generally specialize in one part of the world. So Indiana Jones is a complete fiction, right? Because if you look at Indiana Jones, he knows like eight, eight ancient languages from Mesopotamia, but he also knows how to read Aztec and Mayan, and he knows all about New World stuff. It's, it's Old World and New World, right? Old World being more like you know, Africa, Egypt, um, Canaan, New World, Americas, okay? That's, that's, how it's, that's how it's sort of divided out. Uh, if you specialize in one of those areas, it means you probably don't know very much about the other. Well, um, we've had all kinds of scholarship all over the globe, not only the ancient world in terms of the old world, like Egypt, Canaan, Europe, Africa, you know, Asia. We also have new world scholarship. That's a big, big deal here, uh, especially in the Americas, right? That, that's a, it's a, because it's, it's Americas. It's, you know, Latin America, Southern North America, uh, South America, uh, very, very important uh, areas of study. Well, we've explored this stuff for a couple of centuries now. We, we sort of have a pretty good idea of what's, what's going on, what the ancient world looked like, what ancient languages were spoken, and what they said. Muhammad didn't have that advantage, right? Because when you're going back to the 600s AD, they didn't have archaeologists. They didn't have, they had historians, but they weren't like our historians, like more scientific uh, historians uh, today. And so you've got a lot of mistakes uh, that Muhammad made. One of those is we just mentioned a minute ago. He describes biblical characters as prophets. That was a, that was a big thing in Islam, uh, is. So Abraham's a prophet, and, he, and in Scripture he actually is called a prophet. Um, David has a prophetic role, but it's pretty limited. It's, it's limited mostly to actual prophets who were called as prophets and who served to speak the word of the Lord, right? That's how it, how it happens in the, um, uh, in the Old Testament. But in Islam, I mean, all these figures are prophets, but there's no evidence of Islam before the 600s AD. It just doesn't exist. There's, no, there's literally nothing there. There, there is nothing uh, at all. And then you've got moments where um, Muhammad improperly or inaccurately describes Christian doctrine while attacking it. And so he'll say Christians worship three gods, and we don't worship three gods. We worship one God in uh, three persons, right? And so um, the, the sort of the, the, the technical language is in Islam, Allah is one radically one. And so that is a, uh, a simple monotheism. Um, for Christians, we worship one God in three persons. That is a complex monotheism, but it's still monotheism, still one God, right? And uh, Muhammad didn't understand that. Um, now, he did not have much of a formal education. Uh, he was a caravan um, uh, uh, a person, you know, he, he, he made his living um, um, uh, working on caravans. And so he basically, what happened is he sort of picked up stories from people. And sometimes he picked up stories from people who were heretics. And he passed it off as if it was the truth, as if it was what the Bible said when it wasn't. Uh, you've got one of the most sacred places on earth, uh, which is the Kaaba in, um, uh, in Mecca. And so you, you've got, there we go, uh, you've got the, um, uh, the, uh, this, this sort of black cube, and that ocean of white is mostly uh, Muslim wor worshipers there. And so you look at, um, uh, at this structure, and in Islam, it supposedly goes back to the time of Adam. Adam built it, and then Abraham came along and rebuilt it. And there doesn't seem to be any evidence of it. Um, I'll say maybe in like Old Testament times. It did exist in Muhammad's time. It pre-existed Muhammad's time. But get this, it was a pagan shrine. It was not a shrine to Allah. It was a pagan shrine. And you can go today, and if you're lucky, I mean, you have to be Muslim to do this. Uh, but if you're lucky... Uh, you, you see Muslim worshipers walk around, walking around it. If you've ever seen a video of it, they're, they're, they're walking around the Kaaba, and they walk around seven times. Now, why seven times? That's kind of weird. Because it was actually an ancient practice. The pagans would walk around it seven times. To, uh, uh, because seven was important because that was how many heavenly bodies they could see. 
without a telescope. And each one of those heavenly bodies corresponded to a god. And so Islam borrowed a pagan cult, uh, custom into Islam. Now, if you go to uh, the Quran, the Quran will tell you if uh, you see somebody who is a pagan, oh, they're going to hell. <laughs> there's, there's, no, there's no chance for them. Same things with Jews and Christians. Jews, Christians, pagans, all going to hell. Um, mostly women, actually. Uh, according, to, according to Islam, uh, the majority of people in hell are going to be women. Um, so that's, again, more problems, <laughs> you know, kind, of, kind of mounting up pretty quickly there. Um, but but this, was, this was the idea. Uh, there was so much of pagan stuff that Muhammad adopted. Allah, Allah was a moon god. You know what the symbol of, of Islam is? What's the symbol of Islam? A crescent. Allah was originally a, a pagan moon god, and so he borrowed it to create a monotheistic religion. So there's all kinds of, of problems and issues with this because what are you dealing with? A man-made religion. That's where you get all of this stuff. It's because it's man-made. Um, another one of the issues is you've got um, the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the, the crucifixion. Uh, Muslims deny that Jesus was crucified. That is not part of, of Islamic teaching. Jesus was not crucified. It was somebody who was made to look like him uh, instead, and Jesus sort of got away scot-free while some other poor chump uh, got the axe, right, or the cross. Uh, and then <clears throat> what goes on after that is it leads and sort of compounds to additional, additional issues. So you ask the question, do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? And a lot of people will say yes, right? Actually, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the point of view that says that in the sermon. We won't, we won't talk anything about this. But uh, for people who identify as progressive Christians, oh, yes, yes, Muslims and, and Christians worship the same God. And yet when you go to the Quran, it teaches things that absolutely contradict the New Testament. Absolutely. There, there is no question that it contradicts the New Testament. So, for instance... Um, if you guys could put up this, that, that slide, do, do Muslims and Christians worship the same God, even if, even if it's all the points all at the same time? That would be super awesome. Um, okay. All right, so you've got this, and then you've got number one, uh, those who believe Jesus is divine will go to hell. That's a surah, or chapter 5, verse 72. If you believe Jesus is divine, you're going to hell. Um, that is a foundational belief in Christianity, that Jesus is the Son of God. He is God incarnate. Uh, the second thing is, Allah is not a father. You look at the New Testament. God is addressed as father by Jesus in the, sermon, in the Lord's Prayer. Um, he is described as our heavenly father. Um, and so, again, uh, if... Uh, if you believe that, you are in, a, in, in uh, big trouble. Allah does not have a son. So Jesus is not the son of God. That is foundational in Christianity. That is part of, you know, there, there are some doctrines in Christianity that, well, you know, maybe it's kind of on the fringe or on the outside, or maybe it's stuff that's not quite so important, right? There, there, there are some things that would, we would say more along matters of opinion, right, along those lines. There are some doctrines that are absolutely non-negotiable. Uh, we'll talk about, again, we'll talk about one, the resurrection of Jesus in, the, in, in, our, in our lesson this morning. We'll talk about that. That's one of them. For some reason, uh, and it's still a little bit of a mystery to me, but in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul makes it very clear the resurrection of Jesus is non-negotiable. You do not believe Jesus was raised from the dead. You cannot call yourself a Christian. Um, you know, other, other things like that. Uh, Jesus, Jesus dying for our sins, dying to, to free us from our debt of sin, right? Atonement. That is part of, of the, uh, the gospel. I mean, it's part of the gospel. It is absolutely denied by, by Islam. Uh, Allah does not forgive the sin of shirk. Now, shirk, uh, what that means is polytheism. What that means is you, you, you look at other, uh, other gods as being, as being real, and so what uh, Muslims would say to us is, 
well, you believe that Jesus is divine. Yes, that's what the New Testament teaches. Then you are committing the sin of polytheism, the sin of shirk. You, know, you believe the Holy Spirit is God. Yes, that's, that's clearly what the New Testament teaches. He's, he's part, of the, part of the Godhead, right? Sin, shirk, you're going to hell. Um, I've actually got, I think I put out a video not too long ago that said, uh, I got a clip of, a, uh, of an Islamic teacher and it, was, it, it kind of went the rounds on the internet because he said, if you wish Merry, someone Merry Christmas, you are worse than a murderer. You are worse than a rapist. Uh, you are the worst <laughs> ever because if you say Merry Christmas, it's like you're congratulating someone on their false religion. Now, we would say Merry Christmas. Well, it's just like, for us, it's just a, a, a cultural thing, right? We don't say yay, 25th is, of December is Jesus' birthday, you wheel out the birthday cake and all that. I have heard of people doing that. That is not Jesus' birthday. I would say that's probably the least likely date on the calendar for Jesus' birthday. Um, but, but the idea is you wish someone Merry Christmas, and it's like, well, you're confirming the Christmas story. Well, you know, God came down to earth in the form of Christ. He became incarnate and lived as a man, uh, fully human, fully divine, all the way through, had his ministry of three years, died, uh, was buried and resurrected for our, you know, so, so that we could be freed from our sins and so that we could go and spend an eternity with God the Father in glory, right? That's the, that's the, the, the basic packaging of the gospel. So if you wish somebody Merry Christmas, it's like you're affirming all of those things. So you're affirming that Jesus is a God. That's the sin of shirk. You're affirming all this false stuff uh, that disagrees with the Quran. And so if you wish someone Merry Christmas, and it's, this, it's what this guy said. It's, it, it blew me away that, that he was dishonest. He said, if you wish somebody Merry Christmas, you're worse than a murderer, rapist. And he went down the line and said several other things. Now, I would say that those crimes are about the worst that you could commit. He said, this is worse than that. Why? Because you're saying that there's another God other than Allah. So, um, you know, again, again, that's, 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 you know, you'll, you're, you'll never see, you know, Muslims uh, celebrate Christmas. Well, sometimes you do. Sometimes you'll, you'll see a Muslim who's maybe sort of like liberal or not very committed, and they will be roundly condemned. Uh, there was a, uh, an Egyptian soccer player, uh, Muhammad Salah is his name. He plays in England, but he's been the captain, the captain of the Egyptian team uh, a couple of times, a uh, national team. And, uh, and he, he, he put out a picture on Instagram or Twitter of him celebrating Christmas. And he had his wife, a beautiful family, you know, just him and his wife and his two kids all dressed up in their, you know, Christmas pajamas. And they were absolutely ridiculed for it because you don't wish somebody Merry Christmas. Um, and then you've got uh, the condemnation of the idea of the Trinity in Surah chapter, or Surah 5, that's chapter 5, verse 73. All right, so when you look at all of this stuff um, and you ask questions like, are Mormons Christians or do Muslims and Christians worship the same God? I mean, the answer to these questions is no, because ultimately what you read in the New Testament is this is the, the finished revelation of God. You know, God has progressively revealed himself over time until it, um, you know, ended with the New Testament. Once the New Testament was complete, we don't need anything else. We don't need prophets. We don't need apostles. Um, we don't need additional revelation. We have everything that we need. We, we, we don't need anything else to know what we need to do to be saved, what we need to do to be right with God. We don't need anything else. Some people can't leave well enough alone, right? And you may know somebody like that, and I'm afraid that Joseph Smith and Muhammad were very much the same. They went and created new scriptures uh, that added onto what was already revealed and fundamentally changed everything. You know, does, does Jesus die for sins? Muslim will say no. Uh, is God the only God? Mormon will say no. You know, these are things that are the basic foundational bedrock principles of biblical faith. And members of these two other faiths will deny it. But the thing is, when you look at the scriptures, now again, in, in both of these cases, in both cases, 
They are supposed to be absolutely perfect. The Quran is the word of Allah, absolutely perfect, existed throughout eternity. The Book of Mormon is the most correct book on earth, according to Joseph Smith. In both cases, these books are supposedly perfect. And yet you go to history, you go to archaeology, you look at internal consistency, and they fail the test every single time. The difference between those books and the Bible is when you go to archaeology, you don't st find stuff in archaeology that radically disagrees with the Bible. Now, you may find some funny interpretations or, 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 or some kind of bias uh, of one scholar or another, but you don't find wholesale contradictions with Scripture. You don't find those kinds of things with, uh, with his ancient history, historical records. Uh, you, you find internal consistency. You know, people all the time are trying to find contradictions in the Bible. And the thing is, they always set the bar way too low. They always say, well, this passage says this, and this passage says this. Ah, they contradict each other. Okay, well, look at the context. Look at the words that are being used. Uh, look at the context. Uh, look at what it's really saying. Spend, spend five minutes with a Bible dictionary. Spend five minutes reading the text for yourself. And what you find is that there actually is no contradiction there. It's been manufactured. It's been manufactured largely through ignorance. Um, and again, we're going we're to talk about that a little bit in the sermon this morning. Because you and I are supposed to be literate, intelligent, uh, articulate, educated people when it comes to what the Bible says. And when you have people who are like that, you find that the, the view they have is the biblical view. And the things that they do are biblical things. And the things they say are biblical words, right? You don't find that contradiction in what the Bible says and how we, how we behave, ideally. You also don't find contradictions between the Bible and the evidence. And that cannot be said for these other two groups. And so um, what, I'll, what I'll say is, as in finishing up here, is I'm not saying this to, to try to dehumanize Muslims and Mormons. And I'm not saying this to, oh, well, well they're bad people. You know, oh, they bought into lies and all this other stuff. They need our prayers. They need our prayers, they need our attention, and they need our, need our love. Because you hear these amazing stories of people who, who, I was raised a Muslim, I was raised a Buddhist, I was raised a Mormon, I was raised in this, in this or that other church, and somebody took the time to teach me the biblical way. And now they're going to heaven. What a great place it will be, you know, to, be, to, to arrive in heaven and you see that person that you talk to on earth. And they're going to be with you for, forever, for eternity and glory. What a wonderful thing that is. And so for our religious neighbors, my, my appeal is we need to show them love. We need to show them scripture, right? And help them understand the truth because what they've bought into is a lie. There's a better way, right? There's a better way in scripture. All right, guys. Uh, next Sunday will be our last Sunday. Uh, we'll be here that Sunday morning, so we'll be here for the, uh, for the class and the sermon. Um, so we will, uh, we will see you then. Thanks so much.
Good morning. Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning, our members, especially our visitors this morning. Thank you all for being here with us this beautiful Sunday morning. I'd like to thank uh, every, all the men that were here yesterday for our men's breakfast. Uh, it's been our first one since uh, we had to shut it down for COVID, and man, we had a great time yesterday. Uh, just really appreciate everybody coming by, and thank you all so much. Uh, we'd like to welcome those in attendance today. Uh, members and visitors, please record your attendance by either scanning the QR code on the back of the pew in front of you, or we also have uh, paper attendance cards like this over in, in the front as well, uh, available over in the communion table. Uh, we'd just like a record of your visit if you could uh, drop that off, please. Uh, please remember to silence your cell phones. <laughs> just heard one, so. Uh, communion emblems are available at the front as you enter, and uh, if uh, you're live streaming uh, worship from home, communion supplies are available uh, at the building. Uh, those in attendance are given the opportunity to leave your contribution in the drop box uh, right over here in the back, or any of the elders, uh, deacons can uh, take that for you. We also have PayPal available on our homepage on our church website. Uh, we offer the staff nursery to ages two and under, and the worship training rooms are also available uh, on, on the back end of the auditorium here. Uh, please pick up your Sunday bulletin. We have lots of prayer requests and different announcements that are going on um, at, with the church going on right now. So uh, I have a few announcements here, though, real quick. Um, packing, packing pencils uh, at two will be starting off at two today uh, in the family center. Any of those who have volunteered to help, uh, please, please uh, get here at 1230. We're trying to get everything set up. So if you were signed up to volunteer or you can see Ms. Bree and she take care of it for you. Um, we always hate to say goodbye, but uh, one of our families here, uh, said Sheree, said Sheree, I'm sorry, I think I butchered that just a little bit, uh, family is moving to Ohio. Um, very happy that you, you have found a home church and y'all will be moving to Ohio, but you know, sad to, to see y'all go. We really enjoyed your time being here, and uh, we just wanted to say, you know, we love y'all, and uh, we'll be praying for you. And I think that's all I have. Uh, if you didn't get an emblem, a uh, communion emblem, if you raise your hand, uh, we'll get some over to you. If not, they're over in the lobby. Thank you, guys. Good morning, everyone. Uh, yesterday, uh, I shared some good news with the guys at the men's breakfast, and I want to share it with you guys and gals. Uh, way back in 2008, those of you that were here, uh, we remember the elders signed an oil and gas lease on the church property. Our congregation received a substantial uh, lease bonus payment at that time, and, and ever since then, we have received uh, royalty payments each month. And as most of you all know, uh, oil and gas royalty payments can, can vary based on commodity prices. So that they would really go up and down. But last November, our royalty payments really uh, increased significantly. It's a great blessing. And uh, in fact, since that time, over the last nine months, we have received over about $60,000 of royalty payments that we can use for various purposes here at New York Avenue. Uh, we don't know how long this is going to last, but we're very thankful for God's providence. I want to tell you just a little bit about what we've earmarked or spent these funds for. Uh, most of y'all know we remodeled the kitchen uh, recently and we purchased new equipment. That's been a blessing. Uh, we very recently constructed new monument signs uh, at each driveway entrance to the church property. 
The old electronic sign uh, needed to be replaced uh, as repairs became more frequent and uh, especially more expensive, so we had to do something about that. Uh, we will soon remove the old concrete base to the electronic sign as soon as we get a contractor to do that. Uh, the new monument signs are not totally complete yet. We still need to install uh, landscaping. Uh, that's required by the city. Uh, we'll also put in some irrigation for the landscaping and also some solar lighting for those. In about a week, we will have comprehensive repairs made to the baptistry, and that will include new plumbing fittings, a floor drain, a new fiberglass surfacing, and a gel coating. It will be very, uh, very much improved, uh, safer, uh, and all the way around. But that will be about a three-day job. It will come up in about a week. Then in the longer term, and most of you may have known, may know that the elders retained an individual to provide a architectural and engineering a design services uh, related to the warehouse on our property. Our goal is to utilize that space for uh, youth classes, really any other event that we need to, to use. We just don't want that uh, held vacant. Uh, th those uh, studies are being prepared. We will end up with architectural drawings which would enable us to go to the next step of figuring out a way to, to uh, renovate that building and make it usable. So that, that's kind of a longer term project. We want to get it done as soon as possible, but it's, it's a complicated thing. So just wanted to share all this with you. God is good. We've been blessed with, with these royalties. We, we put back some of the, the bonus payment way back in 08. We still have a sizable amount there that will get us a jump start on the warehouse renovation should it come to pass. It's all good news and we just wanted to share it with you. God bless. Morning everyone. Hope everyone is doing amazing this morning. It's so good to see everyone out. I know we've got a lot of visitors here this morning and we're very excited to see you as always. Of course for our regular members, always delighted to see you as well. But we do want to take a few moments, as we usually do, to welcome our visitors. So, members, let's make our visitors feel welcome.
be seated. We'll have our opening prayer following this. Good morning, church. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we gather around today on the first day of the week to praise you, to honor you, to bring us together as Christians with one love, one faith, and to testify the sacrifice that our Lord Jesus did on the cross for each one of us, for mankind. Father, in this morning, we want to praise you. We want to take a moment to recognize what your son did on the cross for all of us. Help us remember, help us practice what we learned today into our lives so we can show others how much you love us. Use us as an example. Use us to be the members of the body that you want us to be not with just with acts of kindness, but also with um, everything we do in our, our lives to reflect what you want us to be. We ask, us to, we ask you to help us keep any distractions from taking us away from what we need to do here today. We have visitors, we have members who are uh, struggling. We have uh, members who are trying to do what's best for their lives, for their circumstances. We just ask you to be with our visitors, our members who are struggling that same way. We also ask you to keep us safe from any problems that can shake our faith or our love for you especially those who are growing in your faith, growing as a Christian, the youth, those brand new members who are trying to understand what it really takes to become a Christian. Father, we ask you to be with each one of us who are taking the moment to serve you, to serve others, to do what it needs to happen 
to bring up the church, to strengthen the church. We ask you also to be with our brothers who will be leading songs, prayers, and Duane who will be bringing the message this morning. Help him have the wisdom, the words, and the ability that he has been demonstrating in the past few years to show this congregation. We ask you to help us take what he's going to show us and, and teach us and, and apply it to our lives and help us take it to show others as well. Be with each one of us and help us do this morning worship according to your will, according to what you, you expect us to do. Again, we ask you to forgive our transgressions and help us be firm with Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen.
scripture reading in Lord's Prayer. Good morning. We've come to the time in our worship service where we take communion uh, to remember Christ's sacrifice on the cross. And I'll be reading here in a second from Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39. If you would turn to Romans chapter 8, verse 31 through 39. I'll read there in a second. And this reminds me, uh, as this reading through these verses reminds me that as humans, we enjoy staying connected to each other. And we have various tools to do that. One of those tools is obviously right here. And um, it reminds me, we, we were, uh, I was on a road trip with my, my folks and we were trying to meet up with them. And uh, I was calling them. I, I tried to call them so that we could meet up and, and uh, make connections so that we could go through the rest of the road trip together. But I could not get a hold of them. Uh, AT&T wouldn't let me call them. And so Kelly and I, she tried from her phone, her phone I tried from my phone. We wondered if we paid the bill, uh, all, all different kinds of things wandered through our mind. We were completely separated from my parents, and we could not figure out how to get connected because something was wrong. We pulled over, come to find out, an AT&T tower was down. So we eventually got passed to another tower, and we were able to connect with them. Something we do here, or as is tradition here, and, and is commanded in the Bible is one of the reasons, one of the ways we stay connected is through communion, through the Lord's Supper. And we stay connected to each other, to God, to Christ. Um, and that's one of the things I think of as I read this. Verse 31 says, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over us, over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will tribulation, will distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword, just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered, but in all of these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we take this time to remember your Son. 
Thank you for his great sacrifice, and we take this bread, remembering his body on the cruel cross of Calvary, for us, for our sins, for all the sins of the world. Pray that we might stay in the right mindset as as we do this. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us pray now for the cup. Heavenly Father, in in like manner, we prepare to partake of this fruit of the vine, representing Christ's blood flowing from the cross, which also represents the new covenant brought to us that gives us the hope of eternal salvation through him. We pray we continue this mindset as we partake in Jesus' name. Amen. This concludes the Lord's Supper. We also find it uh, convenient at this time to uh, pray for the collection. As was mentioned in the announcements, there are various ways that you can give uh, for the work of New York Avenue here. Uh, We have a drop box in the back. Uh, You can also give your contribution to an elder, a deacon, or you can have it mailed here to the church. And we'd like to offer a prayer at this time for that. Heavenly Father, we are a, a blessed community, um, and we take this time to thank you for all the blessings you give us uh, as we give um, of our means. Father, we pray that we will give cheerfully, willfully, Father, as as we are able, and that the funds used uh, maybe to glorify your kingdom and to grow it. Father, there are other ways to give, and, and many of us do that through our time and our efforts, and we pray for those blessings as well, that you would continue to give us those opportunities, those open doors to to use our talents as such. Thank you for all the blessings. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.
Will you bow with me in prayer, please? God, our Father, we acknowledge that you are the most holy one. Father, we, we praise your name. Father, we look to you for all our being, all the things that we need. Father, please bless us this morning as we are gathered together to worship you. May our worship be uh, pleasing to you. Father, may we uh, take all the distractions out of our mind and focus on our worship this morning and also as we listen to the message. Father, we know that all things come from you and we do thank you for the blessings that we enjoy every day. We thank you for good health that we enjoy. Thank you for family. Thank you for friends, friends and, and loved ones. We thank you for meeting new folks, for our visitors that are uh, worshiping with us this morning. Thank you for bringing them our way. Thank you for those who are interested in learning the truth and those who want to associate with other Christians. Thank you for all these things. Father, we do pray for those of this congregation, those that have ongoing uh, physical ailments that are being treated. We, we, we pray for Sally and Carrie and also Vicki as they continue to receive treatment. For our brother Archie, we pray that his treatments that he just began will be effective and that he will have a, a response, that he will respond well to that. And for our brother Frank, we pray that he'll continue to recover and improve after his recent surgery. Father, for our brother Robert Brooks, we pray for him as he continues from surgery. And also our brother Steve and, and the problems he's having. Father, we want to honor Amy's request for her mom, Karen. Father, we pray for Karen that her treatment and pending surgery will be the right thing for her and that you'll provide complete healing for her. Father, we know that our health is such a valuable thing and we're so blessed. Those of us that are in this room right now can enjoy a very full measure of our health. And Father, we, we pray for those who are confined at home or in other places. Uh, we pray for all of them, no matter what degree of, of illness or problems they have with their health. Father, we're mindful of the Brown family as Millie uh, will be remembered uh, this coming week. We pray that everything goes well as they gather to mourn and grieve her loss. Father, we, we pray for the, the Loney family as they grieve uh, Michael's uh, grandfather. Father, we pray that our time on earth, uh, while we're still on this earth, that we can make the best of our life to follow you, to pay heed to your teachings, that we can study and be familiar with your word. Father, we know it's so important to read and to listen to your word. We're thankful that we have Dwayne here to speak to us. May we pay close attention, Father. May we follow along in our Bibles and, and, and listen closely. Father, thank you for all these blessings, for letting us be here. We pray our worship will continue to be acceptable. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, everyone. If you would open up with me to the book of Jude. We're going to look at one famous passage there uh, as we begin uh, this morning. And the lesson is one that I've thought about for, for quite a while. And um, I guess if I, if I were to, to have uh, chosen a different title, uh, I might have said something a little bit different. Uh, the lesson is titled as A Problem with Progressive Christianity. I think maybe I would have said something more along the lines of My Concerns for Progressive Christians. Um, maybe something a little more uh, kind of getting across the spirit of, of genuine concern for some of our religious neighbors in this world because there are versions of Christianity that are not very helpful and they're not very biblical. And I'm afraid that for folks who are caught up in those, in those versions that uh, it could even pose a, uh, a spiritual danger for, for them. And so uh, in Jude... In Jude uh, verse 3 says, Beloved, although I was eager to write to you about our common salvation, 
I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Now, you may have heard me mention this before or heard this uh, phrase or identification used before, and it's progressive Christianity. And it is a uh, sort of a phenomenon that's been around in different forms in the last few decades, I guess. But there are certain aspects of it that I think um, are not biblical and do jeopardize uh, our ability to be the genuine face of Christ to this world um, in, in looking at this particular thing. Now, what I'd like to do is in looking at progressive Christianity, I would like to <clears throat> start off by saying, for anyone who may have sort of flirtations with it, I hope this is a, uh, an eye-opening lesson for you. Uh, because this kind of thing has been tried before, and it has been tried for decades. And as we look at the results of it, I think what we'll see is it doesn't work very well. And unfortunately, numbers, numbers sort of show that. What I'd like to do, starting off, is look at what are called the Seven Sisters of American Protestantism. Now, these are seven denominations in our, uh, in our country. And when you see the numbers... In these, in these various groups, uh, what I think you'll, you'll find is something that's actually a little bit shocking. In American Baptist churches, over the last 100 years, almost, they've dropped from 1.4 million to 1.3 million. Okay, that's not bad. That's not, a, not much of a drop. I mean, you're probably familiar today with the, uh, the phenomenon that some people call the rise of the nuns. N-O-N-E-S, not N-U-N-S. Um, and that is people who say that they have, uh, when they're asked if they have a religious affiliation, they just say, none. All right, well, there do seem to be more nuns around today uh, than there were uh, in, in decades past. So maybe you can explain some of that al along uh, this along those lines. But then you look at the Christian church or the disciples of Christ. Two million uh, only a half century ago, 350,000 as of two years ago. You look at the Episcopal Church, almost three and a half million in 1959 to 1.8 million in 2020. The Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, 5.1 uh, million in 2020. Uh, that is down substantially, and they are supposed to have less than 20,000 in less than two decades. There are people affiliated with this particular tradition that believe that this entire denomination may disappear by 2050. The Presbyterian Church USA, that's PCUSA, uh, it's a branch of the Presbyterian Church, 3.1 million in 1984, 1.19 million in 2021. The United Church of Christ, 2 million in the 50s, over half, uh, lost over its half uh, of its membership by 2020. And then the United Methodist Church, 11 million, 1967, 6.2 million in 2020. Every single one of these denominations became much, much, much more progressive along the 20th century. And unfortunately, you see the result of it. You see people who abandon these denominations uh, in, in, in droves. And as a denomination becomes more progressive, this is the result of what happens. This is what happens. And what you often find is this sort of common sense wisdom. Well, but, but, but progressive Christianity is more tolerant. It's more inclusive. Those are good things, right? We like tolerance. We like including people. Um, it emph they emphasize love, right? Love's a good thing. That's, that's wonderful. It's a biblical thing. God is love, according to the Apostle John. But what happens is, in spite of these, these positives, practically a guaranteed result is if you go progressive, you're going to lose. You're going to shrink. And these, uh, uh, these, these groups are, a, um, are, are, are a evidence of that. The thing is, what happens on large-scale denominations can also happen on the small scale within individual congregations. Now, this morning, uh, we're going to talk about progressive Christianity and some, some basic features of it and how you know if somebody is going, is going down, these, uh, down this road. 
and why it is undesirable to do that. In spite of the, 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 the positive aspects of it, well, you know, we're, we're loving, we're tolerant, we're inclusive, you know, all that, there are some very, very, very undesirable features. Now, when I say progressive Christianity, I know some will be asking, well, do you mean, what do you mean, <laughs> right? Uh, progressive Christianity, do you mean, you mean biblical faith? And I don't, I do not mean biblical faith. I don't mean anything that's actually biblical, because progressive Christianity is, is the, the, the core of it is to, to grow, to, to change, to adapt to uh, modern, modern culture. And so it puts a lot of emphasis on things that are going on in the now. So social issues as they've developed over the, over the last century, uh, reinterpreting the Bible to make it more relevant for the now is, is a couple of important things here. Now what I'll say, and I, and I do not mean to be insulting at all when I say this, but progressive Christianity is like biblical Christianity in the same way that a cancerous tumor is a living thing. Now does a tumor have the same kind of DNA as maybe you or me? Yeah, it has DNA. Does it grow and develop and replicate its cells like a living organism? Absolutely. Does it have the same characteristics and features and tissues as a living thing? Yes. In fact, there are some types of tumors that they, they grow muscles, they grow bones, they grow organs, you know, sort of. Uh, they grow hair and teeth. In, in those ways, they look very much like a living thing. But a trained physician would never, ever, ever mistake a tumor for a living thing. And a biblically informed Christian, I'm sad to say, would never, ever, ever mistake progressive Christianity for biblical faith. Now, what I want to start with here is our first point, and that is, where does it all begin? Where does it start? And it starts with a lowered view of the Bible. Now, what I mean by this is, we look at Scripture as the inspired Word of God. Uh, we look at the Bible as something that is uh, breathed out by God. But for our progressive neighbors, this is not quite the case. What we find in progressive Christianity is that the Bible is described as being something that is filled with mistakes, errors, and contradictions. It's described as a very human book instead of being a divine book. And what we see here is that it, once, once you've already negotiated that, once you've given that up, once you say that the Bible is filled with mistakes, once you say the Bible is no longer completely relevant to the 21st century unless we work and tool it and shape it to make it relevant for us today, what you have done is left yourself the freedom to negotiate anything. You can do anything with the Bible if you start out with those, those two ideas. So, uh, two things that, that tend to appear very, very, very frequently. Uh, one is, well, let's say your friends believe in evolution, and you believe in the biblical account of creation. Um, you believe that the biblical creation account should be understood the way that it is written. And the way that it's written is that God created the world in six days. And these are 24-hour periods of time. Well, that doesn't really, that's not really um, popular in some circles today. It's certainly not popular with uh, certain scientific crowds that, uh, that are committed to evolution. Now, what many people don't know is that there are certain scientific crowds that are very much committed to biblical creation. In fact, we've got several, several guys in this congregation who work for organizations or work with organizations who hold to a biblical account of creation. Now, the thing is, what we will be told is, well, the biblical account of creation, well, you can fit that with evolution. Now, you'll be told that. Um, please don't misunderstand. I hope you don't misunderstand me as, as me bragging about this. But as somebody who can read Hebrew, that's wrong. There's only one way to understand Genesis 1, and that is as a reference to 24-hour days of creation. Now, the explanation is a grammatical and syntactical explanation from the Hebrew. If you want to know what that is, you can meet me or text me or email me later. Um, that's not something that I'm going to do here from the pulpit. 
But, but if you want that explanation, I can give that to you. I, I, I can give it to you grammatically why. Those days of creation cannot be understood as anything but 24-hour periods of time. But for some of our neighbors, we say, well, that's embarrassing, and so we have to negotiate that. So they will try to shoehorn uh, evolution into the Bible. Now, another way of doing this, and this is another sort of tactic that you see, uh, is that, well, um, well, maybe Genesis 1 is poetry. Maybe Genesis 1 is just poet, a poetic account uh, of creation. Again, if you want the explanation as to why that's not the case, see me later. <laughs> because what I'll tell you is when you look at Genesis chapter 1, it doesn't look like poetry. It doesn't sound like poetry. It doesn't have the same features as poetry. So the conclusion is it's not poetry. <laughs> that's, that's pretty simple, right? That's, that's the simplest way to put it. But what you do is you say, well, it's poetry. It's not meant to be taken literally, so we can sort of play with it. Another way of, um, uh, of, of doing this with Scripture in general is to say that the Bible is a love letter from God. Now, that's a wonderful sentiment, and I'll be honest with you. When you look at God's love and God's grace, it's something that should be absolutely energizing to every single one of us. Uh, I, I'm afraid that when, when people sometimes say this, it's, it's to avoid the negative features of, well, you know, we don't like sin, we don't like judgment, we don't like hell. You know, that makes evangelism hard to talk to people about that kind of stuff. So we'd rather focus on love and tolerance and inclusivity and that kind of thing. And I'll be absolutely honest with you. The Christian gospel is nothing without God's love. It is nothing without God's grace. But the fact is, there has to be balance. And you do find discussions of sin and judgment and hell to go along with on the other side of the coin from God's grace and mercy and love. Now, I do want to look a little closer at the idea that the Bible is a love letter from God because when you look at a love letter, let's say you write a love letter, right? For some of us, it may, it may have been a little while. So uh, you write your love letter to your beloved, right? And well, what do you include in it? Well, you, you write uh, things about the object of your affection that you admire, right? You, you, you extol their virtues and their characteristics that you, that you enjoy that, that attracted you to that person, right? So it's all about that person. And, and you sometimes say, well, you know, it's, it's, you have qualities that other people just don't have. You know, you are superior in some way, and that's, that's why I love you, right? You, you write love letters that way. So the letter is about that person. The Bible isn't a love letter because the Bible isn't really about us. The Bible is about God. The Bible is about him disclosing himself to us. Now, is love part of that equation? Absolutely. He describes his love for us, but it also details our responsibilities and obligations to him. And when you write a love letter, it's about the other person. The Bible is about God. It's about him disclosing himself. Now, when you write a love letter, you also don't include, I'll just say, negative things, right? It's all positive. It's all, it's all sugary and gushy and all that kind of stuff, right, when you write your love letter. Uh, you don't say, uh, how shall I compare thee to a summer's day? Thou art more lovely and more temperate. Now, here's all the ways you're like your mother, right? <laughs> said no love letter ever, right? That, or, that's, or, or it's the last one you write, right? And so when we look at Scripture, Scripture does include those things that we need to have a balanced faith. And so uh, you look at um, things like uh, Paul's diatribes against sin. I mean, he, he hammers sin uh, in books uh, like uh, uh, Romans, Galatians, uh, you look at prophets rebuking the people of Israel, calling them back to obedience after their covenant failures. Uh, what about the Mosaic Law and its covenant curses for disobedience? There's a pretty significant section uh, of those things in the Pentateuch. You look at Jesus himself. He talked about heaven and God's love, but he also talked about sin and judgment. Right? Jesus had a balanced view of the Christian life that had both positives as well as downsides. 
Now, if for someone who has a lowered view of the Bible, you find them saying things like this, I disagree with Paul. I disagree with Jesus here. You know, I don't think John had it right on this. You see, the, the Bible is a human book, and, and there are very creative ways to sort of describe this. Well, the Bible is a human book, but it's got smudges. Right? It's got human fingerprints on it, and that's just sort of a creative way of saying that it has mistakes. Um, but you find that kind of language, and you have to be on the watch for it because it can be slipped in very, uh, very artistically, very carefully, but there's no doubt about what it's saying. It's saying the Bible's wrong. It's saying the Bible has mistakes in it. Culture has changed, so our view of the Bible has to change. This is the most puzzling one of all to me. God is the author, the architect of creation. He, he made us. He built us. He knows us intimately down to the microscopic level. He also wrote scripture. How can an omniscient, perfect God author a flawed book? How could he not anticipate where culture was going? How could he not see, well, you know, in about 2,000 years, they're going to come up with this stuff, and it's going to create a, a challenge. You know what? I'm just going to let them figure it out on their own. Or I'm just going to give them what I give them, and they can do what they want with it. That is absolutely puzzling to me. Puzzling. Because if you look in Scripture, you don't find, necessarily, explicit commands. You do find those. But you also find principles where we could look at changes in culture in the last 100 years, 500 years, 2,000 years, and using those principles that we have in Scripture, we can figure out what God wants us to do. We can understand what God's will is. We don't have to have explicit instructions on what to do with a computer. We know. We've got the principles. We can figure that out for ourselves because God designed us with the brains to be able to do that. Right, so this, this one really is, is the most puzzling to me. And then you have uh, uh, comments like, sometimes the Bible condones things we consider immoral, archaic, patriarchal, and we have to reject those parts. So culture's changed. The Bible, the Bible doesn't change, so we just delete whatever it is that, that doesn't really fit what we want. And so what I'm sad to say is that progressive Christianity takes the whole counsel of God and then it edits it down to suit our preferences, and then, and then it dishonestly claims to be spiritual. But it starts with a lowered view of the Bible. The Bible is something other than the fully inspired Word of God. Now, to go along with that, what we find is that essential doctrines are open for reinterpretation. So, uh, you take a couple of things, we'll look at a couple of ideas here. Uh, one is the idea of Christ dying for our sins. That's a basic, basic concept. I mean, we would all say this is a, a, a biblical teaching. But I ran across a, 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 um, an article from someone, and sorry about the small print there. Uh, it said, uh, there are things I know I don't want to teach. Jesus died for you slash your sins. That's puzzling to me, because if you look at 2 Corinthians 15, 3, it says, I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scriptures. So it wasn't just Paul, you know, because some people will say, well, you know, we just, we just take the New Testament, or we, we just take the words of Jesus. You know, we, 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 sort of, we sort of trim the Bible down to what, well, no, um, Paul was saying, even in the Old Testament, even in the Scriptures. When you see Scriptures in the New Testament with a capital S, almost always it's referring to the Old Testament, okay? So he says that um, uh, uh, Jesus Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures. Jesus died for our sins, and the biblical writers were looking forward to this for almost 2,000 years. Galatians 1, 4, grace and peace, God, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of God our Father. God willed that it was so, that Christ would give himself up for our deliverance. 
Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. He died for us. Paul uh, 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 is, not, uh, is not shy about saying this. 1 Peter 2, 24, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. Not by verbal fiat, I pronounce you forgiven. Not by divine declaration, not by some judicial decision, by Christ's wounds, by his sacrifice for us. We've been healed. Now, the writer says, that we looked at, said the Bible, don't say this, don't teach this. The Bible says this numerous times. There's another place in, um, uh, in the same article where uh, I found the, uh, the writer was talking about the resurrection. And so it said, one thing to bear in mind is this. The point of the Easter story, it's talking about Easter, isn't whether or not Jesus literally rose from the dead. We're missing the point if we're fighting over the historical accuracy of a bodily resurrection. And then later on, it says stories don't have to be factual to speak truth. And it's okay to question a literal resurrection. Not according to the Apostle Paul. 1 Corinthians 15 and associated verses. For I delivered to you as of first importance what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, and that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. And we could add examples in the Gospels where it is clear from the context Jesus has a physical form. Okay? For the New Testament writers, like Paul, the resurrection isn't just an important doctrine. He says that it is of first importance. And again, this is, this is one, of the, one of the, you know, kind of the, the neat little mysteries of the New Testament for me. Why is that the case? Why is it a, a bodily resurrection? Why is that tied to our salvation? Because Paul says that it is. It is absolutely. If Christ has not been raised, we're still in our sins. We've got no hope. We may as well be the most pitiful people who have ever, ever walked the face of planet Earth. But he says it is of first importance that we believe this. And so, things like this bring up some very uncomfortable questions for our progressive neighbors. But Why? Why do this? And this is our last, our last point here. Because it's feelings over facts. It's simply a matter of what we feel uh, being a, a, a allowed to trump what is true. And so why? Why interpret this? Feelings. It's what we want. Now, I can't tell you how many times in social media, books, articles, YouTube videos, stuff on Facebook, whatever, I've seen this passed off, this kind of thing passed off as biblical teaching. And what you, what you sometimes see as is, is a, is a defense of this is progressive believers will say, well, but you see, if you boil everything down to doctrine, then you've got this really cold, dead faith. Well, if you boil everything down to a list, yeah, that's not biblical faith, right? Biblical faith is sound doctrine. Biblical faith is also love in action and service. Again, we have to have a balance of these things. Uh, the problem is that there is an imbalance in some ways. Now, you may have seen people, I know of people, I've been targeted by people who doctrine is everything. And not only doctrine, but their version of doctrine. And if you disagree with them, they are coming after you. They're going to write you up in a publication. They're going to denounce you on social media. They're going to do everything they can to make you look like an absolute fool. Those are not Christians. But going to the opposite extreme is not Christianity either. Because we do have to have balance uh, between doctrine on one hand and service on the other. Heart and hand and head. Well, when we look at uh, look at progressive Christianity, uh, very often you will see the feeling, the the emotive aspect sort of come out, and so you'll see things like, "Well, you know, I just can't believe God would send good people to hell." And if you look at the biblical definition of what makes a good person, uh, I mean, I'll make a case that a good person is someone who's obedient to Christ. 
someone who follows the will of their maker. If that's what a good person is, there aren't going to be any good people in hell. Because if you're a good person, biblically speaking, you're following your, your, your Christ, you're following your God. Uh, you'll see things like, I always thought homosexuality was a sin until I had a, a gay friend. Again, emotions trump biblical teaching. I just don't get why the Bible says this. Hey, look, there's a lot of things that I don't get about the Bible, to be honest with you. There are things that are still, I, I mean, I just mentioned it a moment ago. There's still things that are mysteries to me, uh, and, always, and I think always will be. I think there isn't a person alive who, who would not be able to say, you know, there's some aspect of the Bible that's a little puzzling to me. <laughs> I haven't quite worked that out. I haven't figured that out to my own satisfaction yet. And I think any of us could say this. The difference is, are you looking for answers? The difference is, are you going to investigate? Because that's a biblical faith. That's a faith that goes and digs into God's Word. What is God saying here? You know, this on the surface of it, this sounds kind of sounds strange. I want to know more. I want to know what God is actually saying, exactly saying here in this passage. But for some of our progressive friends, it's, I don't get this. And that's where the train stops. I don't get this. And so I sort of shut off my mind, and then now I have the freedom to go different directions because it's, it's simply a mystery and no one can understand it. Well, I think when we look at progressive Christianity, it's not just that it isn't a very useful point of view, because it's not. It's also, most importantly, that it's absolutely unbiblical. And there are times when it flatly contradicts Scripture. Uh, I just showed a few examples a moment ago. It would not be difficult for anyone in this room to go find examples written by progressive believers where you could immediately use a concordance. You could use a Google search and find out Scriptures that contradict what those writers say. It's not hard. And so Jude 3 he says, I was eager to write to you, very eager to write to you about our common salvation. But he says, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. Folks, we practice the world's only religion that doesn't need modification. We practice the only religion that doesn't need supplement. We practice the only religion that doesn't need additions that doesn't need to have subtractions, that doesn't have uh, things that are embarrassing that we have to take out. And as long as we are using our minds and hearts the way God wants us to use them, we don't have to modify the gospel message for anything or anyone because it is cross-cultural. It, it, it crosses ethnic lines. It crosses gender lines. It crosses national lines. It crosses every line a human being can invent. Because it isn't of human origin. When we start treating it that way, that's where we start departing from what God wants for us. There may be someone here this morning who you're not a biblical Christian yet, you're not a New Testament Christian yet, but you've been thinking about it. And whether it's you know, some things said this morning or some things that you've had this week or last month or that you've just been mulling over for a while now, maybe you want to finally take that last step and commit your life to Christ. And if that's the case, man, we're here. We're here for you to help you in any way that you, that you need uh, to take those last steps in committing your life to Christ, forsaking sin, being immersed for the forgiveness of sins, starting out on that new journey of life that will end with you standing before the throne of God. There may be someone here today who needs that. There may be someone here today who was on that path and got off for some reason. We want you to come back. If you need to recommit your life to Christ, hey, this is the time. And if you'd just like to ask for prayers for something in your life or the life of someone you know who's dear to you, we'd love to hear those. So whatever you need today, let us know while we stand and sing.
Thank you, Duane, for the lesson this morning. Thank you all for being here uh, in attendance. Make sure you're back here tonight at 5.30, packs and pencils meeting, kickoff at 12.30. Uh, our people start arriving here at 2. Uh, it's a great outreach opportunity. Um, this morning we started a new series in the high school class called Me, Myself, and iPhone. It's about how we manage screen time and this tech-driven world. And teens, um, this is one hour of screen time you just consumed today. <laughs> Uh, so mark that on your calendar. Anyway, uh, let's all uh, end with a common line. A com Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you for this day. Thank you for the, all the many blessings you've given us. We pray that the lesson that was brought to us this morning, we will apply to our hearts. We want to pray for the Bryant family who will be leaving. We know that Moving can always be difficult and emotional, uh, nerve-wracking, and we pray that you will be with them, that they have a safe journey as they embark in the next chapter of their life. We pray that you continue to bless them. We pray for our elders who will be making the decision on our next preacher, and we pray that you bless them and give them the wisdom to make the right decision. We pray that this congregation will always stay on the, the narrow path, always stay true to your word. Thank you for all the many blessings you've given us. Watch over us and bring us back at the next appointed time. In Jesus' name, amen.